We want to make sure you do it exactly what your mother said. Chew your food, be good to your neighbor, and keep your elbows off the table. Okay? <laughs> 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 Sounds like you don't. I'm not <laughs> I have here the fine basket, which I'm going to send out. Uh, our goal today is to embarrass the people who were at the, uh, volunteer, uh, the Valentine's Day episode. Uh, if we get some money, they won't have to publish their memoirs. All right, here we go. Here, when it comes to graces or our blessings, I still cannot forget Paul Ransford. There was nobody among us who brought us such a sense of, of our principles, who, who taught us that it, it, our principles were important in every culture, every age, every time. So I, I just, he taught us really that, that, that it was, our principles were a way to become our better selves. So I, for that, I'm so grateful to Paul. We've also lost, in the last few months, a great number, a goodly number of our members. So, uh, so we, we grieve together, but let's not forget they lived their lives among us and they were very, very important to us. So let's take one deep breath, take two deep breaths, and let us give some thought to those whose shoulders we stood on. And make no mistake about it, we didn't invent this, we're just part of it. We stand on other people's shoulders. Okay. So let's get, take just a moment and give some thanks. Okay. So, uh, a few months ago, Omar brought a friend here named Paul Casey, who uh, taught us a little bit about the the direct the, uh, the craft beer business. Uh, now, at the end of his talk, he talked about a sipping parlor or a tasting parlor or some place in which I've never been. Never. But I have been in a few saloons. And I really wanted to talk to you about saloons. Now, I'm not talking about a place where you're going to get a chocolate flavored martini 
was called the Passion Fruit Juice Gimlet. I'm talking about a place where men and women of a certain age can belly up and get a proper stand-up drink. So it's very important. A place where you're gonna go and find out the latest cahoots that are going on at the City Hall, where uh, maybe uh, an affair of the heart can be moved along gracefully to the next level, where there are no end of, of uh, nicknames. I mean, nicknames usually are given to people who actually screw up. I mean, they are monstrous mishandlers of things, and they always get a nickname. My favorite has always been from a guy who I, I knew up in Syracuse who had mishandled several marriages, any marriages actually, and uh, he was known as Tombstone. <laughs> so, so here we are. Here's a salute story, and I'll quit with this. I have a dear friend, Timmy Flynn, who comes from Marblehead, uh, Massachusetts, and he tells the story of being there on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Well, first of all, Marblehead is a place overrun with Irish and Irish types. Just, just too many Irish people. Too much wordy. Uh, it's a little too cooked and tempered. Uh, a little dangerous sometimes. So anyway, Flint tells the story that there was this Wednesday or Thursday that uh, he comes into the place. It's not jammed. It's almost crowded. It's a good crowd, but just, just before the five o'clock buzz. So there's a guy at a, a horseshoe bar. The guy is sitting in the corner. He's a very plain guy, quiet spoken, not, uh, clearly not a mixer, certainly not a regular. So he's there. He's drinking slowly. It's about two o'clock. He's drinking slowly but steadily. So about 4.30, as I said, he calls the bartender over and says, I want to buy the house a drink. And the bartender, not knowing the guy, says, are you sure you want to do this? We're talking about hundreds of dollars. And the guy says, I want to buy the house a drink. So they set everybody off with an extra drink. The crowd gives them a little huzzah, and they go back to what they're doing. So my friend Flynn says, I can't stand this. He goes over to the guy and says, look, what's the story here? Uh, did you hit the number? Did your divorce papers become final? Uh, did your uh, horse come in? He says, what's the story here? Tell me. And the guy turns to him and he says, he says, at 11 o'clock this morning, my bookie died. And that's the story. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason you can buy anybody a drink. <laughs> Yeah. You ready to talk? Short? You're done? You said short. You're done. I'm, I'm ready. So do you. I'm ready. <laughs> You're done. Hope I will watch out of the old El Supremo or El Magnifico. But here he is. He is what we got. Thanks, Phil. All right. Thank you, Phil. Um, Dictator is the, the word I prefer, but whatever you want to call me. Um, real quickly, everyone, I went around each table. We have these uh, sheets of paper on, on your table. There's a new idea that the membership committee's come up with. This is uh, These are our member fun facts. We want to learn a little bit more about you so that we can share this information with your other Rotary Club members. We're not going to sell your data. I promise you that. Um, someone asked me if this was going to go on a new Rotary uh, dating site. That's not the case, but please fill it out and turn it in over at the table to Tim Smith at the end of the meeting. We'll do this for several weeks. And we're just going to publish this, this information within our own membership to share. You know, if someone, Pat collects salt and pepper shakers, and um, so does Bill White. Now they know they each collect salt and pepper shakers, or maybe someone's a scuba diver, maybe someone uh, you know likes to play tennis. So that's really the goal between behind the uh, member fun facts. Really quickly, we are going to talk a little bit about DAC DB. DAC DB is a rotary platform where you can gather a ton of information, where you can email members, where you can find out information phone contact information, find out and email our club 
There are different levels of access. I've had a lot of people email me and ask for someone's address. Don Heineman just passed away. How do I find Rose's address so I can send her a card? Um, I, I would like to send a notice out to the club. This is how you do it, and Jeff Harrison is gonna speak briefly. I'm gonna hold the microphone and, and share with him um, the stage as he, as he talks about DAG TV. This is a great arena for you to communicate amongst your members and find out additional information about our club. We also have the ECH Rotary website. So those are the two main platforms for you to access. Jeff. Okay, um, so the first thing we want to do is look up a member. Uh, so get, this is the home page we're on here. You go over here to my club. So you go to dacdb.com, first of all, www.dacdb.com. Okay, and then you go to the login page. Jeff, do you mind back up the login yeah. page? Uh, let's see if we'll let it see. We may have to log out and do that. Oh, there you go. Okay, so you go to the login page. He's automatically logged in. But your, your, your login, we'll send this out in the email. I believe it's your last name and your birth date. Linda, is there anyone who can confirm that? Your initial login information? I think it might be your user address, your email address. Okay. We'll, we'll send that out to you to confirm. Just so you start out at the login page, then you get to here. Oh, sorry, Jeff. Okay. Okay, and by the way, I'm not Tim Smith. I do have the name up there. Okay, you go to find member. And here we can do a search. Uh, let's say, uh, search. And there's Omar right there. We can click on him. And there's all his information for you. You can also go to my club. Let's back up. Just click on my club, and if you click on, you go all the way to one side, there, there, you see club members in the upper left-hand corner. Okay, there are all your, our, our club members right there. You can scroll down, you can see there's our board, you can scroll down, and right here is everyone's name, their phone number, and their email. Some of that might be more restrictive on lower views. I'm not exactly sure what. No, we can all okay. no, sure. no. We can all access. So, so there's your club right there. Now, you have to have a higher level access, I believe, to send out an email. But if you uh, do want to send out an email, you know, if you mind backing up, uh, go to email over on one side. Okay. And. You can see it's from Tim Smith, and if you click on two, you click on click on where it says two, you can go to our club, click on top where it says club, click East Chapel Hill, click the button that says East Chapel Hill, Jeff, and update all members. Oh, oh, oh you want to oh, yep. um, Click that box. Now this, I usually don't use that. Um, I'll say one, one. That includes, uh, and also includes, uh, People we probably don't want to include. I'll go. I go uh, member types and active and active R85. Okay. Uh, another way to do it. Okay. <laughs> okay. And then click update names. Right at the bottom. And now you're sending an email to the entire club. Okay. Those are two simple functions. I just want to introduce people to that DB. You've probably heard it. We you have a link every week to our YouTube videos of our meetings. There's also a link to DAC TV. We'll send you login information. I just want to provide you a very brief screenshot and a few brief directions about how to get there and what it does. We'll continue this uh, as the weeks move forward. And if anybody has any questions on any of this, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email. You can call me on my cell phone and I'd be glad to set up a team meeting where I can show you some more of this. Is there a suggestion box in there? <laughs> um, I there, see a there, there? There's not a trash can, but if you do have any suggestions, please uh, forward them to us and we'll make sure they get in the appropriate place. Thank you, Jeff. Um, before we get to our speaker, does anyone have any announcements? Linda Sanders. 
So everyone should have a passport in front of them. Your membership committee created this passport, primarily focused for new members, to help new members get oriented. And I'd like to recognize the three people who really helped make it happen. Larry McCants, Lida Colon, and Penny Hodgson. Uh, the intent of this is really just to provide some simple facts about Rotary. We've got the four-way test in here, the list of committees that we have within the club, the range of service events that you can participate in. I suggested here are some things that as a new member in your first three months, we recommend that you do. It also has the DAFDB email address here. So whether it's our East Chapel Rotary Club, the website, the DACDB, a lot of good information in here. And we'd like this for not only the new members, but the existing members too, to take this and fill it out and uh, you know schedule some time with Omar or other members of the board and get a little <laughs> more familiar with, with what they actually do. Thank you, Linda. Big round of applause for Linda and Linda. Thank you. Uh, we do have some guests here today uh, that we'd like to introduce. Uh, I'd like to start off. My mother, Carol Ann, and my son Orlando are here. Wow. Is Does anybody else have a guest they'd like to present? Yes, Matt in the back. Patrick, we're Patrick Brennan. Patrick is a repeat offender here, and I hope to see more of him here. He's a great member of the community, and he's a good guy. Welcome, Patrick. Lorenzo. Yeah, thanks. My wife, Mary Lynch. Great to see you there. Yeah. Yes. This is um, Jackie Orza, and she is my mentee as part of a UNC Women's Student Athlete Mentorship Program. She is a sophomore at UNC, double majoring in econ and public policy, I think, um, from the DC area, and um, she's a rower. Thank you, Jen. You're welcome. Ms. Gardner. Yes. You take this piece of paper, you crumple it up. Um, any other announcements? Any other introductions? Okay. Um, our speaker today is, is someone very dear and special to me. Um, we grew up together. Uh, he was a very close friend of my brother's. They played on the same soccer team for many years at Rainbow, culminating in a state championship in 83 at the Chapel High School. He was one of my former babysitters. I vouched for him when his now wife was asking my high school girlfriend about him. I said, look, this, this is a great guy. This is this is definitely marriage material. Um, it's true, we met at Pepper's Pizza, we, we all double dated, and I gave him my, my seal of approval. But the real Josh story, and I don't know if he told this story last time because I wasn't here. And I, I selfishly, I know he spoke to us 11 months ago, uh, but selfishly as president this year, I wanted to have him come back and speak. I. I arranged to have him speak before he announced it, which is it's no surprise. He announced his candidacy for governor. Uh, but he's speaking to you today as an attorney general of North Carolina. He will not be promoting himself. 
any more than I promote myself on a daily basis. <laughs> um, but my favorite Josh Stein story has to be at his wedding. He called me up and he says, hey Omar, you know, I'm getting married to Anna. You know, I want you to come to the wedding, but you know, and Josh knows that I used to DJ. I was, I was like the breakdance <coughs> DJ rapper guy. And he said, I want you to DJ my wedding too. And I, I was like, Josh, I haven't DJed in forever, but he's like, I really want you to do it. And I said, all right, well look, if I DJ, I've got these lights, I'll bring them, but you know, if I DJ, I really recommend using a fog machine for the light. Cause you know, you put lights on the dance floor and you don't have any fog, you can't really see the lights. There's no, there's no you know, particles to bounce the lights off of. And I said, it's your call. I said, if you want to do it, um, you know, we can tell them or we can just do it. He goes, well, let's just do it. So we're up at the Carolina Inn and you know, everything's set up. Ceremony goes off without a hitch. It's time for the first dance. The first dance, nice slow dance, you know, probably something like, you know, reunited. Okay, Anita Baker. A nice slow song. And then it's time for the whole crowd to join in the fun. And so we put on Celebration by Cool and the Gang. You know, everyone comes out on the dance floor. And the first thing I do is I just hit that fog machine until it just extinguishes. And it's like, you know, and at some point, you know, it's got to regenerate and the fog is done. So at that point, the general manager comes over to me and he goes, hey man, hey, you gotta kill the fog. We have these new smoke detector sensors in here. But, you know, if, 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 if they go off, I mean, the whole Carolina Inn alarm system's gonna go off and, and you know, you gotta kill the fog. And I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm probably like, I don't know, 23 and I'm like, but you can't see the light without the fog, man. Like, you gotta use the fog. And he's like, you gotta kill it right now. And I said, okay, no more fog. And literally, 10 seconds after he tells me that, the entire Carolina Inn alarms go off. Everybody, there were like three weddings going on. Everybody has to be evacuated. True story. So we get out the back, you know, and I'm feeling about this big, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the whole Carolina Inn's cleared out. The fire company has to come up, the fire station. Fire marshal comes up, and I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to have a huge fire. I don't know what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, five minutes later, you know, we, we go outside, five minutes later, we come back in, the party kicks back up, and I never hear about it again. But it was a wedding to be remembered, and um, I don't think any of us who attended that wedding will ever forget. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it off to the Attorney General, my buddy, Josh Stein. Omar is right about that. I've yet to have one of our friends who attended our wedding now 26 years ago who forgets our wedding. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have these weddings a long time and you're like, I think I was there, but no one forgets the Stein fire alarm wedding. <laughs> the only thing about Omar's introduction that I frankly found a little terrifying was I did not realize that my fate was dependent on his validation. <laughs> but somehow she said yes. So here I am, uh, and it's wonderful to be with you all. Uh, Carol Ann helped raise me, so it's very wonderful that you are here, Carol Ann. And by the way, Omar was my first babysitting gig, and Omar was my last babysitting gig. <laughs> I'm like, this is hard work. Five dollars is not enough to try to rein that boy in. Always wonderful to be in Chapel Hill, hometown. Uh, your principal, I just read it in the passport, which is a great document, is service above self. And that is a principle that I learned from my family and my faith. You know, my parents moved us to North Carolina right after I was born, so that my father, Adam Stein, who I expect a number of you know, um, could join with Julius Chambers and James Ferguson to form North Carolina's first integrated law firm. And they went on to lead the legal battle against discrimination and for equality here, not only for North Carolina, but for the entire country. They did this work in the face of immense hostility, including when someone firebombed their offices and, and burned it to the ground. 
but they would not be deterred. Chambers, Fergie, my dad taught me that our constitution and laws are meant for the people. And that's all of the people, not just the wealthy and well-connected, not just the powerful and the privileged, but for everyone. The factory worker, the farm worker, the first responder, the small business owner, secretaries, school teachers, veterans and voters, for everyone. And in my life and work, I've seen how we can make the law work for the people. I certainly see it as your attorney general. You know, we saw Purdue Pharma, the Sackler family, other drug companies making billions and billions and billions of dollars while millions of Americans got hooked on opioids. So that we led a national bipartisan coalition of attorneys general from across this country to take these companies to court and we're winning more than $50 billion so far. When I talked with you all a year ago, we had just finalized the $26 billion settlement against the three major drug distributors and one of the manufacturers, Johnson & Johnson. Well, that money is now flowing to local communities all across the state. 75% of the money, um, excuse me, 85% of the money is going to counties, 15% of the state, but regardless of where it goes, it has to go to help people who are struggling with addiction. And since the last time I was here, we've now secured an additional 20 plus billion dollars from the three major drugstore chains, Walmart, Walgreens, and CVS, and other manufacturers. So all in, it's over $50 billion. North Carolina share is gonna be 1.4 billion. And it is going to make a difference. We're, we're in a, a terrible, tragic, deadly moment in what is the deadliest drug epidemic in American history. Uh, and it really is a, a crisis of three phases. It started out essentially from 2000 to 2010, 12 pills, and that's what was killing people. When people got addicted to pills, then moved on to heroin because it was more plentiful and cheaper. And then that was the second phase of the crisis. And we are in the, the deadliest moment, and that's the fentanyl. Because fentanyl, heroin, you have to grow a, a plant, and then you have to go to a manufacturing facility and produce it. And it's big and bulky. Fentanyl is just chemicals that are put in a lab, very small, insanely uh, powerful, 50 times more potent than heroin. And it is so deadly. Uh, and that's eight, something like 75% of all people dying of a drug overdose today in America have fentanyl in their systems. And in North Carolina today, on what are we, February 24th, on average, eight people are gonna die of an overdose <coughs> of fentanyl. Eight people died yesterday. Eight people are gonna to die tomorrow. So we've got a ton of work to do. It requires responding both on the supply side, trying to interdict as much at the border as we can. And last year, more was captured at the border than any other year in history. But it also means breaking up drug trafficking rings here in North Carolina. And I just asked the legislature this week for additional prosecutors who can specialize in doing these cases in my special prosecutions unit, a, a federal a fentanyl um, control unit. But it also has to do with demand and helping people who are struggling with addiction overcome that addiction so that they don't feel this compulsion to go out and get that drug on a daily basis. So that's what the $50 billion will help us to do. Uh, we saw Juul, the e-cigarette company, sparking a teen vaping epidemic here in North Carolina and across the country. I sat with kids whose lives were turned completely upside down from this nicotine addiction. Failing grades, quitting sports teams, needing medical treatment. So North Carolina, we made North Carolina the first state in the country to take up a court and the first state in the country to hold them accountable. We set a standard that the rest of the nation has now followed. We changed the way Juul can market and sell their product to protect young people and $40 million help young people conquer their addiction to nicotine. We saw sexual assault kids piling up on the shelves of local law enforcement agencies all across the state. We did a count in 2017 and came to the terrifying realization that there were some 16,000 untested kids across the state, untested. Of those thousands of kids, they came from individuals. Each one was a person who experienced 
a terrible traumatic violation, and then voluntarily underwent an invasive physical examination to deliver evidence to the criminal justice system, and it was put up on a shelf. So we are attacking that backlog. We are solving cold cases. We're delivering justice for victims, putting rapists behind bars, and making our community safer. Just about two weeks ago, we crossed the 100 person threshold on arrests, and those arrests were responsible for at least 175 violent crimes we know of. We saw a criminal justice system that treats black people and white people differently in this state. So the governor put together a task force at, at my request called the Task Force for Racial Equity and Criminal Justice so that we could come up with concrete recommendations to make our system fairer and better. And we did 125 recommendations, and now we are in the process of implementing them. And they, it ranges the entire system from when you recruit an officer to how you train that officer to the policies by which that officer engages the public, from the decision of whether to arrest or issue a citation in lieu of arrest, to a person going before a magistrate for first appearance, to their trial, to their incarceration, to their post-release. There are things we can do at every stage of the process to make it better and, and fairer, and we're working hard to do just that. We saw polluters poisoning the water that people drink. We took DuPont and Camorge to court for discharging Gen X and other chemicals that last forever, PFOS chemicals, into the Cape Fear River, provides drinking water for all of Southeastern North Carolina. Hundreds of thousands of people draw water out of the Cape Fear River for their drinking water. Imagine the terror of being a family member, a mom or a dad, and worrying that the tap in your kitchen that you give your children water from might make them sick or give them a, a, a disease. So we are holding them accountable to it. We helped to negotiate the largest excavation of coal ash in the history of the United States, 80 million tons. And then we won a $1.1 billion settlement with Duke Energy about paying for that cleanup that are gonna generate savings for every single customer of Duke in the state of North Carolina. We saw people being targeted because of who they are. And we've defended people's right to live their lives free of discrimination. Everybody should be able to be who they are and not fear about being mistreated because of who they are. We saw a legislature that punishes certain voters through partisan gerrymandering. And in the words of the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, which for the non-lawyers in the room is the level right below the U.S. Supreme Court, Fourth Circuit said targeted African Americans with, quote, almost surgical precision. Those are the words of the court. Well, I, we have defended people's right to vote and to vote in fair districts because in our democracy, the people are supposed to choose their representatives, not the other way around. And the state should be about protecting people's right to vote, not restricting them. I, I do this work, it's how I was raised. It's all about trying to make a difference in our state and people's lives for the, for the good. And I am convinced we can, we can make North Carolina even greater because what a great state we are blessed to live in. Our people, are friendly and hardworking. Other than Omar, they're funny. <laughs> Our land is beautiful. Blue Ridge Mountains, the Barrier Islands, everywhere in between. What a gorgeous state we are in. And the economy is strong and growing, although unevenly. It's not as uniformly uh, good news out there as we want it to be. But what I do know is that if we invest in our people and their futures, we will grow even stronger. So that means we have to bolster public education from pre-kindergarten through community college and university. Every kid who starts kindergarten needs to be healthy and ready to learn. And when that child graduates high school, they have to have the skills and knowledge to succeed whether they want to start college or start their career. 
That means we have got to pay our teachers more. We are number 50 in the United States. And what we spend on education is a share of our economy. 50. It's pitiful. I just had the great good fortune of coming to you all uh, from Sewell Elementary School, Omar's and my alma mater. And we were talking, uh, We one thing that we've done uh, at the Attorney General's Office is create something called Family Tech Agreement. It's very basic, kind of four rules, like don't talk to strangers, don't put stuff on the internet. You shouldn't, if you're confused about what you're seeing, talk to your parents and remember there's a world outside. But the whole purpose of it is just to spark a conversation between kids and parents about responsible internet use because you know the average middle schooler spends five and a half hours a day. The average high schooler spends eight and a half hours a day on the screen. It's totally different. When I, when I told the kids, I said, yeah, I used to go to school here. By the way, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have computers. They had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> But because we grew up in a different time, we don't know what it's like, what these kids are experiencing. And so I'm investigating Instagram and TikTok because they've designed their platforms to be addictive to young people. And we are paying an immense mental health price in terms of what kids are experiencing. The number is something like 20% of North Carolina teenagers thought about suicide in the last year. There is something fundamentally wrong. And so we have a lot of work to do to help young people thrive and succeed the way we dream for them. Uh, we have got to build the economy from the bottom up and middle out, not the top down, and make sure that there's real economic opportunity broadly distributed across North Carolina, including small town North Carolina. You know, things in the triangle, are going great, not for everybody, but it's going great here, it's going great in Charlotte, going great in the triad, Asheville, Wilmington, so many things are going great in North Carolina. Do you know that although we were one of the fastest growing states in the country over the previous decade, half of our counties lost population. So there is a real problem. That means that we have to invest in broadband. We have to invest in roads and railroads. We have to invest in ports and airports. There's so many things we can do to make it so that somebody in a small town who wants to stay in their hometown actually has a future. They gotta have a hospital. Only two other states have had more closures of rural hospitals in the last 15 years in North Carolina. We're one of the only states in the country that has not expanded Medicaid. You can't build a business and attract employees if the schools are no good, or if the broadband doesn't work. There are things that we can do to help people who, if they want to work hard and succeed, they should have that ability no matter where they live in this state. There's so many things we can do uh, to build a better and brighter future for North Carolina, one that is rooted in our shared values of freedom, justice and opportunity for everyone, but we have to go about doing that work. None of this just happens. We have to work together. And you all are all about that. I mean, I love your four-way test. It has more resonance than ever. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? will be beneficial to all concerned. Think of all the challenges we face in this world. How much better would we be if all of us adhered to and tried to live up to those principles? And so I commend you for what you're about. I commend you for being integral weavers of the social fabric of Chapel Hill to make it an incredible place to live and grow a family. So thank you for having me this, this afternoon. It is always a pleasure. And whenever you invite me, I'm going to say yes. I apologize, but you're going to have to hear me over and over again. Thank you. Questions, right? Happy to do questions. We'll start back there with Nick. So tell us what the pharmaceutical firm that we're doing and the pharmacies themselves that put... I can't pay that, that kind of a So, 
from the pharmacies, what we saw. Jake, can you repeat the question? Yeah. The question was what did the pharmacies do wrong? What did the drug industry do wrong that uh, made us want to hold them accountable to the $50 billion chain that we did? And different parts of the drug distribution chain did different things. So basically, the way drugs are produced and distributed in, North, in the United States is you have the manufacturers. Then you have the distributors who take them from the manufacturer, give them to the pharmacy, and then you have the pharmacies that dispense them. The manufacturers invested vast sums of money to convince the medical community that opioids were the safest way and most effective way to treat pain. We now know neither of those things are true. There are other ways to treat pain in many instances which are more effective and they are highly addictive. So we got them for their marketing. And we've now, as part of our agreements, made them eliminate all marketing. Uh, and a number of them have actually gotten out of, uh, out of the business. The distributors have a legal duty under federal law to monitor the distribution of their drugs, particularly controlled substances, addictive, dangerous drugs like opioids. And we alleged, None of these companies admitted culpability, but we alleged that they failed to monitor different pharmacies and how they were dispensing. And there's data that is unbelievable. Like if you look at this community and the number of pills they got, it would be each person in that community would have gotten hundreds of pills per person. And they just were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, so we made them come up with a clearinghouse that will monitor the entire industry and ensure that that doesn't happen again. And then the drugstores, it was a matter of just responding to whatever prescriptions came in and not monitoring. They also have a legal duty to make sure that they're not over dispensing. Uh, you mentioned Medicaid, which is clearly a part of addressing inequity yes. in health care. Yes. Um, what is the chance of the state uh, deciding to so we're one of the only states in the country that has not expanded Medicaid and as such we have among if not the highest percentage of adult population without health insurance it's very hard to get health care if you don't have health insurance other than to go to the emergency room in which case you rack up unbelievable medical debt I also just as an aside before I further with your question I say to the legislature, I say, if you all are serious about the opioid crisis, the most effective thing you could do is to just say yes to Medicaid expansion. Because drug, drug treatment is healthcare, and people can't provide things without compensation, so mm -hmm. give them a means to pay for it with their health insurance. So this is the best moment, the brightest opportunity to actually get it enacted. The House just passed it. The Senate passed it last time. So for the first time in 12 years, we not only have the Democrats on board with it, but the Republican President Pro Tem and the Republican Speaker of the House, they all say this is a good thing for North Carolina. So you would think, okay, this is great, it's done. But they had the same words last time and did not pass it because there's one issue that they disagree on. And my view is, one of skepticism is stop talking about it and just do it. And if they do it, I'm going to be incredibly thankful and praising of them for doing so. But I just worry that they're spinning wheels and we got to keep pushing. So if you, I'm going to talk to your legislators, let them know. What's the issue? The issue has to do with what's called certificate of need. And we have a state law that says when hospitals or doctor practices want to get more beds or get an MRI, the State Department of Health and Human Services has to do an analysis and conclude there actually is a need for that in the community. And it, it's really about in helping hospitals, which have much higher fixed costs than uh, independent doctor practices. So they're worried about taking away profitable services from hospitals so that they're only stuck with the expensive stuff that they can't afford. Um, and the, Senator Berger in the Senate, I think, has some very legitimate concerns about certificate of need, but fundamentally, it's not the same issue. They're both healthcare, but you could absolutely do Medicaid expansion 
and then do certificate of need. And that's what I hope ends up happening. Josh, I have a good friend that's a county commissioner in a rural, rural town in eastern North Carolina. He said that 62% of the citizens in that particular county are on social services. How in the world do you climb out of a mess like that? Very difficult. I mean, what you do. What did he say? The question was there are four rural eastern North Carolina counties where over half the population depends on some form of social service. And then how can you build a different future, a brighter future for those folks? I mean, just analyze it from your perspective. If you wanted to start a business in that community, what are the factors that you would require before you would move your family there? You want to make sure your kids could learn in the school. You'd want to make sure that if you got sick and had an emergency, it was a hospital emergency department within 30 minutes of your home. You'd want to make sure that if you're a business, your internet worked so that you could actually compete with all the businesses who are in the big city. So there are things that are just fundamental infrastructural necessity for a community to have a chance of a good future. And so we in the government can't create economic growth, but we can create conditions in which businesses can create economic growth. And we've got to take a disproportionate share and, and buttress those communities that need a little extra help. If we had tied the minimum wage to inflation in 1973 and Social Security, it'd be well over $25 an hour now, $53,000 a year, comment on how that compares to what we're offering starting teachers and what the future of minimum wage is in the state. The question was minimum wage and how it hasn't been raised in decades. Uh, and had we just tied it to the cost of living increases that happen every year, it would be multiples of what it is today. Uh, I used to be in the state senate before I was attorney general and I introduced a minimum wage bill that set a new minimum wage and tied it to inflation going forward and uh, it did not get a hearing and it was criticized as you can't just willy-nilly tie this to inflation we actually had a debate on the floor as what inflation actually was but then they the leadership brought forward a bill on campaign finance dramatically raised the limit to what individuals could give to political campaigns and then tied it to inflation <laughs> so every year like every two years when it comes time to making political contributions, the number gets larger and larger and larger because things do go up in price. So it turns out they actually do understand what the concept of inflation means. It's just they're uh, not as broad-minded as to who should be the beneficiaries in my view. I'm confused about gerrymandering, okay? Yeah. I've been hearing about this North Carolina gerrymandering. In fact, I heard about gerrymandering 40 something, 50 years ago when I was a kid, just got out of college. Yep. And it just seems like it just never, ever it gets, gets tracked in and gets resolved. So a few years ago, I thought this thing was done. But it's not done. Can you help me understand what's going on with the gerrymandering? No, but I'll try. <laughs> the question is, is, what is up with gerrymandering? And first of all, just so everyone has the same baseline, gerrymandering is when districts are drawn in a certain way to favor the political party in power. Now, redistricting happens every decade by definition, because population shifts. So you need to draw new districts to reflect where the people are so that each district has the same number uh, of voters. But the problem with gerrymandering is it allows the people in power to perpetuate their own power by discriminating against voters who they don't like. And we know this has happened in North Carolina. The last decade, we had 13 Congress people. North Carolina is a 50-50 state. On a good year for Republicans, it's 51, 49, maybe 52, 48. Um, but it's 50, 50, and I know this because I went with 50.1% of the vote. <laughs> so 10 to 3, 13 congressional people, you think, okay, maybe 7 to 6, 7 Republicans, 6. It was 10 to 3. 78% of our congressional delegation were Republicans. Some political scientists who evaluate the health of representative democracies around the world applied their methodology to the United States. We were the least 
representative democracy in the Western world, in North Carolina. So they re-gerrymandered again in 2020 because of a new census. And people went to court and said, you know, these are gerrymandered maps. They're helping this party. They're discriminating against certain voters. Uh, my team and I filed a brief with the North Carolina Supreme Court exactly one year ago, arguing that under our state constitution, there are rights that we possess to free election, free speech and association, and equal protection. And that those rights, individual rights, are being <coughs> violated by partisan gerrymandering. The court agreed with our arguments and struck down the maps, ordered the legislature to draw new maps. And our congressional delegation in Washington is now 14 because we picked up an extra congressperson because of the census. Our delegation is seven Republicans and seven Democrats in our 50-50 state. So it's great. Let me tell you a bad story. So the Republican leadership did not like that. And they have actually appealed that to the U.S. Supreme Court under something called the Independent State Legislature Theory, which is a radical, brand new uh, theory that has never been espoused and, in fact, contradicts essentially 200 years of precedent. And the question is, is who has the right to interpret the Constitution? Judicial review, I mean, basic separation of powers is legislature makes the law, executive enforces the law, and the judicial interprets the law. Well, they're saying when it comes to gerrymandering, there is no one to review what they do. They are have plenary power to do whatever they want, even though our state constitution reads all political power is vested in the people alone. And so they're saying that the Supreme Court doesn't have the right to interpret the state constitution to protect people's voting rights. They can do whatever they want. And we're worried about what the U.S. Supreme Court's going to do. We were up in Washington in December arguing that case. They may win that, but they're like, that's not good enough. Now let's go back to the North Carolina Supreme Court and petition for a rehearing because we did not like the decision that the Supreme Court rendered in last year that partisan gerrymandering violates our state constitution. Getting a rehearing in front of the Supreme Court is unbelievably rare. It's happened twice in 30 years. When it happens, it's because there's a change in the law, meaning that a higher court made a decision that makes the decision that the lower court made no longer right, or a change in the facts so that the court just misunderstood what was happening. Almost never happens. They petitioned for a rehearing on this case and on a voter ID case. Both petitions were granted by the Supreme Court. The only variable that changed no change in the law, no change in the facts. The only variable to change is the composition of the judges on the court. So they're like, we like this judge, these judges more, and we want you to strike down the decision that your previous court made. These are, for lawyers in the room, kind of foundationally shaking because it's not how our jurisprudence is supposed to evolve. So I'm genuinely worried. Can you, can you speak to what we are doing with funds from the lottery. You know, when we talk about education in North Carolina and we're number 50 in terms of paying teachers, I think we have a fairly significant fund. How are those funds being allocated? The question was, what about the lottery and those, the education lottery? And is that making a difference on education spending? There are restrictions on how the lottery receipt, receipts can be used. I don't know what the latest numbers are, because but last I saw it was like six or seven hundred million. Maybe it's a little higher because I just haven't focused on it. So it's a chunk of change, but honestly, all it is is a revenue source, and that money gets put into the overall general pot of the general fund. And so long as the state spends more than six or seven hundred million on public education, which of course it does, they just say, well, this six or seven hundred million out of public education is coming from that source instead of every other source. It's, it's all fungible. And we um, woefully invest in public education, our lottery notwithstanding. Okay. Uh, yes. um, I want to go back to separation of powers. The thing that I'm the most concerned about in North Carolina at this moment in time are checks and balances, which affects everything. And I mean, we've seen it with the diminishment of the um, governor's role in education, particularly a lot of us in here care about the University of North Carolina system. 
Uh, we now see them talking about uh, reducing the power of the Court of Appeals and even the Wake County Commissioners are running. So talk about, uh, just expand more on checks and balances and sort of the fear that a lot of us in North Carolina have about us looking more authoritarian than a lot of other states right now. I share your fear. I, I don't have a happy answer to the question. The question has to do with separation of powers and do the branches have respective authorities sort of check the other? And when Governor Cooper was elected, y'all remember in 2016, the General Assembly, Republican-led General Assembly in December came back for a lame duck session to pass a raft of bills just to take power away from the governor before he assumed uh, his spot. Now, the Supreme Court of North Carolina in a couple of important cases, for the most part, reaffirmed the principle of separation of powers and actually struck down a number of those bills, not all of them, for instance, the appointments to the Board of Trustees to UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and that was Republicans and Democrats together on the Court of Appeals. And so it stood up for this kind of core democratic principle. Uh, the fear is real about if this General Assembly engages in uh, power grabs, and they're doing it with the State Board of Education. State Board of Education is the governing body of public schools in North Carolina, appointed by the governor. They want to take that authority away from the governor and mm -hmm. assign the, the slots to State Board according to the gerrymandered legislative districts that they want to reinstitute. So they want to turn, even though you need to have a Democratic governor, you want to make it a Republican State Board of Education, and then they can do all kinds of things to public education, which they're already engaged in uh, act after act to weaken our public schools. So I share your concern. Mm. You know, what a wonderful country, the, the longest continually uh, democratic nation in the history of the world, over 200 years. I mean, so much wonderful things. But what past does not guarantee the future. And it every, frankly, every two years in North Carolina, it's going to be a battle not only over policy, but over democratic principles, in my view. Right. Josh, thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> Josh, a couple of questions. Sure. Thank you very much for, for getting bipartisan uh, in your settlements. It, uh, that's where I hope you do that because we have these differences. How do you distribute the funds, 50 million, a billion, and we got one billion? Secondly, with all these successes you've had, was the previous governor general asleep on the job? And then lastly, these great successes, where are some of your failures? Many. <laughs> um, Did you understand what he said? I understood, <laughs> I understood a lot of what was said. Okay. Uh, one had to do with bipartisanship. And one thing about attorneys general, and it's, it's really actually very sad because we were sort of the last of statewide elected officials that have worked well and collaboratively. Um, but I would say starting about six years ago, it really started to deteriorate and it's getting worse and worse. And so we're falling into partisan camps, just like in the Congress, just like among governors. And it, it breaks my heart, <laughs> it does. Because on things like the opioid crisis, people are dying in Tennessee, just like they were dying here, dying in West Virginia and Ohio. Those other three states, they're all Republican AGs. And so it was actually the Tennessee Republican AG and I that led the national coalition. So we're able to find opportunities to work together and I've worked well with our Republican legislature here on opioids. We passed laws to reduce overprescribing, to give law enforcement more tools to go after pill, uh, pill prescribing drug rings. And so there are things we can do together. They tend not to get nearly as much attention as the things that we fight about. Um, and my goal is always to try to find things we can work on in common ground. Um, failures. I don't want to depress us with that one. <laughs> that last question, Mark. You know, I deal with this opioid crisis thing every day. And, and uh, you made the comment that it, uh, 
that opioids were one time considered the gold standard for modern severe pain, but now we know that they're much better thing. I don't know that. Yeah, I can't. Uh, I can't tell you that that's true in my experience. Yeah, you had to do uh, certainly the reporting things that have been happening where you you have the um, notification so that you has evidently cut down a lot on abuse from prescribers. Yeah, but it's part of a, a group. I mean, you, you do certain kind of meditation during the day. But if somebody wakes up in the middle of the night and uh, they are having a lot of pain, yeah, I can tell you for sure that Toradol or all those little uh, insects that are supposed to be so damn good, take an hour and 45 minutes to kick in, hydrocodone in 15 minutes and you're feeling better and you're sleeping and you go back to sleep. So you give somebody maybe eight of them after a surgery. So it's not a lot, it's not enough to cause addiction, but it's, it's almost necessary to keep somebody from having a real important abuse. Yeah, and yeah. I do not disagree. Opioids are absolutely a valid medication that the health, the medical professionals should be able to prescribe. Right. And there's nothing that we've done to change that. We've just stopped the 60 pill prescription that oh, people I used to write. And if you look at medicine cabinets all over the state, we were averaging, God, what was it, 700 pills per person per year? Wow. Well, no. I'll give you this one. As far as I'm concerned, oxycodone could be banned. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like you compare, it, like you that, compare bro. the United States to Europe and Japan, <laughs> we're prescribing five to ten times more prescription pain pills per capita than those countries. And we do not have five to ten times more pain. We just don't. But it's how we did medicine over a 25 year period. Um, so. I'm glad you asked that question because by no means am I arguing they should be illegal. Or you know, you used to see before this, before the reporting thing, yeah. you used to see that pharmacies would share with the prescribers what the patient's history was, and you see where somebody had given them a piece, had been given multiple prescriptions for like 300 opioids. Yeah. You don't see that. Which is That's a good right. thing. Yeah. Thank you for the, that clarification. And the question on how the money gets distributed, there was a formula that allocated among the states according to harm and population, and we got, we're about 3%. And then among the counties, they worked out their own formula. Again, the metrics were based on what the harm was in that community in terms of overdose deaths and overprescribing. And so the money is going out that way. There's a website called ncopioidsettlement.org that we required the local governments to use. And starting at the end of this year, so in June of this year, the first reports we issued, they have to disclose exactly who they gave the money to, how much, and what were the outcomes, because we want this money to actually save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Um, in appreciation of your coming and speaking with us today, we have a gift. Uh, our Terrence Brave Boy has a charity raising money for education uh, for children in Africa by selling crafts. A minus gift. What's that? A minus gift. Uh, yes. I call it a mean. Is it a minus? It's a minus. Oh, a minus. It's Terrence Brave Boy. It's not. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Terrence. I've been there. I've been there. It's like all. So. Thank you for coming to speak with us. There's a Tar Heel book for you today. Thank you.